Good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church tonight. We're going to sing number 542. If you would stand and sing with me, please. We're going to sing verse number one and number four. Verse number one and four. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time to come to worship you. Lord, we pray that you would be with the service tonight. Bless the preacher and his message. Be with those that aren't here and on our, our prayer list. Lord, watch over them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing number 341, first and third verse. 341, victory in Jesus. good help you know that but for the amount we're paying them i guess we're getting what we're paying for <laughs> we're glad to have you here with us tonight working on that that's my son, grandson playing running the powerpoint and 
Richard's skipping the verses and they're not skipped on the PowerPoint. So you're trying to go through them. Amen. Did a good job. That's that's my granddaughter playing the flute. This is my youngest granddaughter, oldest granddaughter over here playing the piano. And uh, actually, it's not okay, but uh, it's it's good to have you here. But this is my wife on that side playing the organ. So, and we're glad to have you here with us tonight. We're we're going. I'm gonna in, in a series. I'm on. I don't know if I'll finish it tonight about. The rewards of the righteous. Uh, it's a little different than you think. And if you don't get your last stage stuff, you know, like the end times things, I want to teach you something theological, okay? That's called eschatology. The study of the last days. You say that out loud, the crowd people think you're smart. You really are. You know what? Your eschatology. We'll work on that. And so if you say... Your exegesis of the scripture for the eschatological verses, you really seem, nobody knows what you're saying, but it's just the way you, that you bring it out, okay? And so what I want to show you is that if you, if you don't keep the scripture in mind, if you don't get anything else, the Lord promised us that he would save us if we got, if we trust him as Savior. But that's not all he did. It's a, it's a, I don't know that we're going to know everything. I don't want to preach my sermon, but until we get there, we're going to find out all, all that he did for us. Paul would say, we see through a glass darkly, then we're going to see face to face. And so it's going to be kind of neat, isn't it? To be able to do that too. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. Tonight after church, we're going to do something really, really fun. We're going to honor our graduates. We have one from this year and one from last year. We didn't get to do that. And right after church, if you didn't bring anything, you're still welcome to stay in eat uh, sandwiches and chips and refreshments with us as we honor the graduates. They're going to do a duet together in the back. And we're looking forward. You guys are ready, right? Okay. I had a whole sermon ready for you. It was an acronym of graduate. Go get a job. (laughs) Run and get a job. Always be looking for a job. Don't hesitate to get a job. So write down all all the things. And all the parents are going, yes, amen. And so they're getting through. And so one's going into college and one of them's deep into college. So we'll work in that as we go. But we're glad that you're here with us. Look on your calendar of stuff that you have, one in your bulletin if you pick it up. And Bible schools are coming up two weeks from tomorrow. It starts. We're excited about that. It's going to come up on us fast. We got some of the coolest stuff. Uh, it's a circus theme. So we've worked on this decorations and things. We got some stuff worked on. It's going it's to be cool. But I'm and Kylie and me and whoever else we thought about but worked on popcorn boxes. And so we have one big popcorn box, one medium popcorn box, and the so it'll say large, medium, and small on these popcorn boxes. That's the way Cheryl eats popcorn, just like that, amen, in a big bowl. But it's uh, just uh, going to have a good time with it. We're going to share the gospel with the kids. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know Christ as your Savior. But there's more to the Christian life than that. And so we're going to try to get some of that across. And um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I know the world's serious, okay? Salvation is serious. Heaven and hell are serious things. But isn't it strange that God made us so that we can laugh? That we laugh? You know, matter of fact, the Scripture says God is going to be the last one to laugh. Do y'all know that? He gets the last laugh. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it ought to be interesting to be there, right? Remember that? And then camp coming up on July the 12th. Looking forward to that. And then when you're praying about that, I want you to pray for one of our missionaries, Lukianovs uh, in Russia. The, the preacher may have get to keep their son for a couple of months uh, because they're sort of stuck in between. They've been there, I don't know how many years they've been there. Anybody remember? Uh, he's a Russian to start with, and he came over here and got saved and worked for me while he was going to Bible college uh, at the church camp. And that's that was at least 22 years ago, maybe more than that. But they've got two children, and they're here because um, they can't go back to Russia. And Debbie's getting her citizenship so she can stay there because the missionaries are tightening down. So she can't leave and come and take care of the special needs boy. He's 20. And uh, he's, so he's going to come and stay with Uncle George for a couple of months. And Aunt Cheryl for a couple of months. See her smiling over there? He speaks English. You're going to love him. 
we'll look forward. If we get to keep him, we'll see. I'm betting if you were a mama, what would you do? Well, what would you be doing if you were her right now and you're a mama? You'd be thinking any way in the world that you could get here to spend those two months with him because he doesn't have any place to go those two months. So he's in between places. So, and so I, I guarantee, I look for him to say, no way, we're going to do what we do. And I can understand that too. Lots of things to pray about. Lots of things. Be careful with your praying, will you? No, you have to worry about being careful for all the little details of your life when it comes to the things of God. But be serious about your prayer. Spend some time with God. And you say, I don't know how to pray. We're talking about that. How do you pray? You know, I don't know how you do it. I just talk to God. Because if I did it any other way, he wouldn't know who it was. You know, So I just talk to him. Start it and try it. We got a, the lady's going to do a special for us, and then the quartet's going to come and sing. Is that next order? Okay, here they come. This is our offering prayer. So, shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day that we've enjoyed. Uh, the nice sunny weather, get out of the rain a little bit. We give you all praise and glory for that. And we uh, are here to thank that our offering is in well in thy sight, and may it be used the way that you intended it to be. And we pray for our missionaries. We pray for our preacher and staff. Pray for our leaders. And uh, we we just hope and pray that we're doing things that is glorifying you. This we pray through Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
is due, the lowest tale. The guilty pair bow down with care, nor gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. It's chapter number three. Go from one mark to the next one. We're going to read it in just a second here. And uh, we're talking to you about rewards. Um, the scripture is explicit in saying that when Jesus died, he paid the penalty for all sin. There are seven judgments listed in the scripture. And one of them is the judgment of sin. A judgment can't be done until it's taken care of. You say, well, well, what about us? You know, we get things. Well, we have blessings and we have consequences and stuff in our life, but they're not judgments. A judgment's the final thing. Y'all ever go to court and get a judgment? It's the final thing. However it is, it is. When God makes those judgments, that's what He did. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus paid for the sin of all past people. Pay for the sins of everybody that was there at the time and everybody in the future. It's a done deal. You either trust Him as your Savior and His blood covers that because there is no more sacrifice for sin. I'm quoting a scripture verse. There is no more sacrifice for sin. You couldn't add anything to that and to think that you would stand in front of God and say, God, I know your perfect son died for me, but I believe I can fix it, make it better. So I don't think that you are thinking correctly with what you're talking about. The absolute God of the universe died for us. He paid every piece. Okay, so as a Christian, I want you to get this. We're not judged for our sins. Jesus paid our penalty of sin. And I, I listen to preachers all the time. You're kidding. Nope. I listen to preachers all the time. If I'm in a vehicle or going somewhere, I can tell you where all the preaching preachers are on the radio stations. And I listen to what they have to say. And there is a great thought. If you work your way to heaven, how much is enough for you to get there? If you have to be good, What's your standard of good? C. 
to you, I'm talking, okay. You never know. There wouldn't be an answer for us. There's the answers there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's the foundation. All through the Old Testament, he's called the foundation stone, the rock, the cornerstone. That's what everything's built around him. And so he's got the foundation laid. That's salvation. What do you do with it now that you have it? See, that's what determines rewards. But if you're talking about where rewards come in at, <clears throat> if you get your end time studies out of the mixed up, you, you got a problem. Because rewards are laid up in heaven. And I'll tell you a little bit when we get those, because the scripture tells us. And then we use them back on the earth. So that means we've got to come back here. That's when the kingdom is set up. The Lord's going to have a kingdom for a thousand years. And we will rule and reign with him in it. And I'll show you the verses for that as we go. Let's look at a timeline real quick. We'll go through it fast. Now, if you started with the cross, then the next thing that you'd come up with would be the, the end of the church age. See that little break in that line? The end of the church age would be what we call the rapture. The word rapture is not in your Bible anywhere, as far as I know. Uh, there, it does say they're catching away. But I keep reminding you the word cat is not in your Bible either, but they're real, okay? They really, really are. So uh, then after that, we have what we call the, the first resurrection at the end of the church age. This is the first resurrection. It starts with those with Christ and goes through and through those that are killed in the, in the tribulation, okay? They get to be a part in that first one. The Revelation writer says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection, for over them the second death will have no power. Isn't that cool? You're Right. The resurrection. Do you know that everybody's going to be resurrected? All the good people and all the bad people? You say, where'd you read that at? Well, I first read it over in the Old Testament because it's quoted there. Daniel would say it in Daniel chapter 12, there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. The Lord Jesus preached it as well. One's going to have a body prepared for being with God, and the other's going to have a body prepared for being separated from God. You say, well, I don't like that. Take it up with God. All right? We're going to go to what we call, the Scripture says, the judgment seat of Christ. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul gives us <clears throat> the information we have of that in his epistles. And once he tells us we're not allowed to judge each other, because all of us are going to be judged by the same judge for our works and service. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, that doesn't mean I can't know what's going on. When I pick up a jar of peanut butter and there's no peanut butter in it, I have the right to say, well, I hate to make a judgment. It appears this jar might be empty, but I hate to make a judgment with it. It's empty or not, right? And, and we know what's good or bad. So you have, the, you, you have no power to judge with a penalty or with a reward. All judgments aren't bad. I'd, somebody, I like to say this, what is it you don't want, but if you ever get it, you don't want to lose it? A lawsuit. Yeah. Amen. You want to make sure you win everyone you get into. That's what we work at. That goes on in heaven. That judgment seat of Christ goes on in heaven while the tribulations going on in the world. I, I believe we're all going to go through the tribulation. Well, the Bible says the tribulation time would be the wrath of God poured out on the unbelieving world. It's hard for me to believe God's going to pour out His wrath on all of His people. That doesn't seem like God to me. You go back to the, Rev to the book of Genesis and the guy named Abraham. The Lord showed up with two of His angels and spoke with Abraham and said, He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to go down to Sodom and I'm going to see if they're as wicked as they have been told they are, okay? Or he sees here. And so he said, if they are, then we're going to destroy them all. You know what, you know what Abraham did? Abraham said, Lord, if there's 50 righteous men there, would you destroy it? And he said, no, I won't destroy it for, for the 50 righteous. Sake. And then he went to 40. Then he went to 30. 
And then he went to 20. And then he went to 10. If there's 10, the Lord said, I won't destroy it for the 10. Now the reason he got down to 10, he went, Phew. his nephew Lot lived there. So if he had nephew in his lot, he had daughters too, and he had two married daughters. So you got two, four, six. You got sons-in-law, so you got eight. I probably had at least two grandkids. He's got ten, no sweat. I got it done. But when what Abraham found out, that that wasn't true. Lot had not taught his kids and had not reached his family. When he went to them to talk about the Lord, they laughed at him because he had never lived the, Lord, the life of a, of a Christian. Okay? So when you get into that, well, then we move forward after that and we, we come back in the Lord's return and He sets up His kingdom for a thousand years. Uh, at the end of the thousand years, uh, get the judgment of the living Gentiles, living Jews and Old Testament and tribulation saints and then resurrection of the unsaved at that time. And you can read about that in Revelation chapter number 20 some other time, okay? I want you to look with me though to the book of 1 Corinthians, and it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, uh, <clears throat> you know what a metaphor is, right? Right? I, I thought you might. Oh, we're not really building a building out of wood, hay, and stubble. The three pigs did, but we won't. Or silver and gold and precious stones. The kingdom of the new Jerusalem will be built with that, but we normally don't build with that. But it is a picture type of the kind of works that a Christian, a man or a woman who knows the Lord Jesus has in their life. We have gold war, uh, services. We go, where, where, you say, who determines that? God. And then sometimes we have wood, hay, and stubble stuff. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If I run gold through a fire, what's it do to it? Purifies it, doesn't it? Silver through a fire. Precious jewels just burns off the dross. What if I run wood, hay, and stubble through there? It just burns it up, okay? Now listen to, to this whole point. He said, if any man's work abide, which he had built thereon, remember he had to build on the foundation of Christ, it's a believer, somebody that's trusting him as their Savior, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Now watch. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. See, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's a matter of rewards. And what God's really going to do, He's going to clean up everything that you did for Him. It'll be a greater gift. Now watch what we do. Now, we live in a world that doesn't has all kinds of measures to get you to believe in anything besides God, to trust in anything besides the Word of God. The devil doesn't care what you believe, as long as it's not the truth. He don't care what you do, as long as it's not right. He don't care what religion you practice, as long as it's not serving God. Do you understand that? He'll help you do all the wrong things. That's what a man or woman, boy or girl in Christ has to understand. You can fill your life up with all kinds of things. And I'm one of those people that I believe God meant for us to do good things. Jesus said we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves. There's a time to do good things. Is there time to help each other out? And one of the religious Jews said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered him. And he said, the Samaritan come by. That was the despised person, you know, the neighbors that live down the block that nobody talks to. Well, he came by and found the man beat up. I like the word, it leaves it, and half dead. Isn't that cool? He's half dead, all right? That's what we were when Jesus found us. We were physically alive and spiritually dead. Half dead. And he bound him up, took him to the inn and paid for it all. And he turned to the guy and said, now which one of these people? Three of them passed him by and one of them helped him. Which one's his neighbor? See, 
Jesus wanted them to get understand that's that's the what we're supposed to do. And we try that at our church. We try it in our life. Just because you say I'm on my way to heaven doesn't mean you don't have a work to do in the world. My, I, uh, I grew up, I was telling my grandkids the other day, they were talking about being poor. Now, you, you don't even know poor. Do you understand that? If you've got a flushable toilet in your house, you're not really poor. If you've got running water in your house, you're not really poor. If you got a car, you're not poor. If you can afford to pay the two dollars for the cost to go to school for supplies when you're a kid, you're not poor. I grew up we didn't have any of those. We didn't think we were poor. Because I lived on a cattle ranch and we had food and a garden. You know what my dad was known for? Take this pig. Take it down to these people, those poor people down the road. I was always thinking, who could be poorer than us? You know what I mean? But what I realized they didn't have a pig. And we shared. And I listened to me. My dad grew up in a small town in North Florida. We had a cattle ranch there. And when my dad died, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people showed up at his funeral. There were 11 or 12 different police officer association groups that showed up. He would take in anybody. Alvis Edmondson said he drove by through my hometown one time, stopped at the station and said, you know that you know George Newcomb? He said, well, we don't remember him, but we know Charles Newcomb because he fed us one time when we didn't have food. Okay, that, that's the way it is. That's what we're supposed to be. Now, my dad got the Christian part of it a few years later. After I got saved, he did. There's nothing wrong with you understanding that God's going to use you in the world to reach people. When Jesus wanted to reach his own, what did he do? He healed the sick. He, he gave the eye, blinded eyes sight. He took away their leprosy. He, cleaned, he did all those physical things. And if that wasn't enough to get them to come and hear him preach, he'd feed them much. 5,000 and 4,000 at a time if he had to do it. Amen? Okay. See, none of that stuff's wrong. And if we use it for the right purpose, then it's not the wood, hay, and stubble thing. We have a purpose in what we do. Now, I don't know about you guys. We're going to have Bible school. And, and maybe me and Mike Kenny, neither one, will get a reward because we both like Bible school so much, we'd have it if it wasn't for God because it's just fun. We'd have a good time in it. And we want to share the gospel with all the kids we can and with all the adults that will listen. But I want you to get this. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. You say, well, I don't like for people to know, you know, I don't think the right hand ought to know what the left hand doing. Every time I've ever heard a person saying that, the left hand ain't doing nothing. The left hand's not doing anything. When Jesus had the young man come and say, you know, how can I get in eternal life? He said, give up everything you got. Because the first rule was, oh, that's will have no other gods before me. And he wouldn't do it. He worshiped his stuff. If any man's work abide. Look at that last verse. This is cool stuff. I, I don't want you to get over this. You can't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. I don't care what anybody tells you. The scripture says, Jesus said it. I know my sheep. They know me and follow me. I give unto them everlasting life and they shall not perish. Neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. My father, how many of you dads ever played that with your kids? You put a little something in your hand, and they had to try to pull it open to get it out. You, you ever played that with your kids? It's fun, because that's the last time you can do that. After you get older, they just hurt your hand. Okay? So, can you imagine being big enough and strong enough to pry God's hand off of you? Come on. Why would you need God? Just start your own heaven. You're not going to do it. I give unto them everlasting life and they shall never perish. You say, well, how long is everlasting? Last time I checked, it was everlasting. And never perish means you'll never perish. And over and over. And he said it three times redundantly from Verse 27 to verse 30 in John chapter 10. We have what we have 
in the foundation of Christ, and we're securing it. What we're missing is people who let their light so shine before the world that they give glory to the Father in heaven. Today, if you were in our Bible study class, one of the great verses in the book of Jonah is, Jonah went there and preached, and God didn't really give him a choice. He said, you want to spend the rest of your life in a whale seminary? You want to go preach in Nineveh? And he said, you know, I'm tired of college. Send me to Nineveh. And he goes, and he preached to him. This gives you the point that you don't have to love people to preach, and, but you can join with that guy. But the Bible says when the Ninevites heard, listen to what the word of Scripture says in Jonah. Go back and read it. They believed God. They believed God. And God spared them. See, that's what we want you to see. Paul said in the book of 2 Corinthians, for we are His ambassadors. That we are here in His stead saying, be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we do with that is what we either have a reward or we don't have a reward. And I want you to get to the end of this. If you look up here with me, you see, when he comes back, we use these things in that millennial reign. The disciples are always saying, you're going to set up your kingdom now? You're going to set up your kingdom now? You're going to set up your kingdom now? That's the last thing to ask him right before he ascended into heaven. And he ignored it. And he said, no, nah, I'm, but I'm going to tell you what you are going to do. You're going to have the power come on you to preach the gospel. Go back and read Acts chapter 1. What are we doing in this millennial reign? Uh, my brother, who is in heaven right now, and I get there, I'm going to laugh because he told me he wasn't going to believe in God anymore because he got mad at God. And let me, let me show you a verse. Can I? You say, well, preacher, you know, if I'm saved by faith, if I don't believe anymore, then I must be lost, right? Well, that's not what the Scripture says. And you say, well, how do you know that for sure? Because it's book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. If we de be dead with Him, we should also live with Him. He's talking about being dead with the flesh and living in the Spirit. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Isn't that going to be good? God's going to reward us for the things that we suffer in our life for the cause of Christ. In America, we do very little suffering. Around the rest of the world, they're dying for the testimony of Christ. But listen to what he said. If we deny Him, He will deny us. But if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You just point your little finger at God and say, God, I don't want you in my life, and I want to walk in the world without you, and I don't want you to marry. And I guarantee he's a great gentleman. He'll turn away and he won't. I doubt he'll break your neck or your leg or anything else. You can just run through life. You say, well, what if I just quit believing? Did you hear the verse? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. For he cannot deny himself. When we got saved, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And he promised us in the book of Ephesians 1, chapter 1, that if he didn't keep his word, we got to keep the Holy Spirit. It is the earnest of our inheritance. You put money down on a house and then you back out of your contract. What's that money called? Earnest money. What happens when you back out of the contract? They keep your money, right? That's right. Nothing, not a greater lesson learned than that one. He said he can't deny himself. That's part of us. We're sealed with it. We go through all these things and all that we have, and then when we get into eternity, nothing we did on the world is going to matter. But we're not there yet. Have you ever thought this? Anybody ever ask you? If, I, if you could have... $2 million, would you spend 10 years in prison for, to get it? Would you give up 10 years of your life in solitary in prison for $10 million, $2 million? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I've read stories where men robbed banks, hid the money, and just rode it out. By the way, when you get out, the money's still not yours. They just follow you and take the money. Okay. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. You're telling me that you would sell the time that you have with your children and your wife 
and your grandkids and your friends and your neighbors and in time to serve God for money? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Do you know how long a thousand years is? Anybody here know how long it is? It's a thousand years. That's why it's called a millennium, right? That's a long time. The rewards we earn, we're going to use in the millennium when Jesus rules and reigns here on the earth. I want to, I want to show you something real quick. I know you got all this down, but look with me quick. This is a doctrine timeline. Doctrine. This, I'm going to go by biblical doctrine. Paul told Timothy to, to observe doctrine and be careful because in it he would save himself and others. Okay? And the truth of the Word of God. The true church, if you see that line, if that's where Jesus left it when he came in, left in the, this original church, it was never perfect. If you're looking for a perfect one, you need to get out of it because time you get to Acts chapter 5, he has to kill a couple of people to keep the church straight. All right. Look what happens. The Catholic Church breaks away about 300 A.D. The Protestant churches break away from the Catholic Church. They come almost back to where God would have us to stay around 1860. They discover a new thing called... Uh, it's pretending to know that you know more than God. And so they started uh, critical thinking. Well, you know, how could God be good if he created the devil? And how could, you know, and, and go foolish things. The trouble is, is that they, they started back toward him. And if we, I'm, I stopped it at 2000. I'm telling you, we're pretty close to the middle of uh, even the best of us in our doctrinal stances right now. And what does that leave us? There are seven church ages named after the seven churches, the Revelation. And we're in that Laodicean period. The last one down at the bottom. That Leo means what? People. The diocese of the people. The people rule. Not God. The people rule. In the last days, that's where we are. Very little is, is taught about doctrinal things. Now, I want you to stand in front of God when you're judged as for your works and service and have something in your hand. Uh, if you looked in, the, Jesus said, lay not up your treasures on earth where rust and moth are. He said, but lay them up in heaven. You, know, you can't take them with you, but you can send them on ahead. Isn't that good? Yeah, better in Western Union. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If any man build on this foundation, we went through that over and over and over. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But it says, if any man works abide, he shall, he shall receive a reward. The Lord takes care of that for you. Hebrews chapter 6. He's not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. He's got it there for you. So what we're concerned is this here. Watch. We're at the church age. At the rapture, we go out. And we get those rewards while we're with Him in heaven. Same time the marriage supper of the Lamb happens. When He comes back, the Revelation in chapter 21 says that He's coming back with ten thousands of His saints. Ten thousands. Don't know how many ten thousands that is. With His saints. We'll be that group to set up His kingdom. And... Uh, how many of y'all are, are just infatuated with like Armageddon and that kind of stuff? Just, just, you just can't get enough of that. And you always are, you found out and, and you know, you've already got the number of people counted. They're going to be there because you've got it down to a science. You know, the day they're leaving home and what they're packing in their rucksacks and everything, right? I, some people think they do. I do know that way before China was what it is now, God said that the king of the East would, would bring a, million, million foot soldiers across. The only place I've ever known that could have a million million is China. It drives up the Euphrates to get here. 
Okay? We, we, everything's set up for that to be right now. But it is not now. We're still here. We still have time. There are still people to win. There are lots and lots and lots of Christians in China. Did you hear me? We have embedded Christian movements that we support in China. And their reports tell us that about 10,000 Chinese a week come to know Christ as Savior. Okay, they got three and a half billion. Takes a while to make a dent in it. Their persecution is off the chart. It's amazing what's going on there and how much they're suffering. But you, you, I don't care who they are or what you think about them. God loves them. I, I want you to get this, guys. You, this this paralyps half the people I know. God loves the Arabs. How many of the Arabs have we brought in our church and preachers one to the Lord in the last 10 or 15 years? More than I got fingers. If you let me, I'll win the rest of them to Jesus too. They make great missionaries, guys. I'm telling you. Nobody is better to win an Arab than another Arab. A Muslim than another Muslim. And those are two different things. But I want you to understand that when we come back to rule and reign with Him, there won't be any more work to be done. What's to be done has to be done right now. When we're called out, we're done. During the rule and reign of Christ, that thousand years, there's no service to be done, but instead we'll all enjoy the rewards of it. And I'm going to give you a hint, and I'm going to be done, okay? We go back to the verse. The Christian's going to be rewarded with honor. We'll cover this next week a little better. Honor. You know what honor is? That's where you get to sit. Two of his children, James and John, John the apostle who wrote the book of John, and James the first apostle to die as a martyr, came to him and said, Lord, in, when you set up your kingdom, can we sit on the right and left of you? And he said the strangest thing. He said this, look down to verse 23. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. Okay, if the Lord can't give it to you, what does it mean? It means you have to earn it. That's one of them. Second one is the crowns. I, some people get seven. I, I put them together because I can see only four. And that's the crown of righteousness. If you see that, that's not being perfect. It's for being faithful in what you're perfect in your service. A crown of joy, that's a crown of soul winning. Do you know that 90% of Christians never win anybody else to Jesus? In their whole life. I, I want you to understand, guys. I didn't set out to be a preacher. I don't even know that God ever said, you know what, if you don't go preach, I'm just going to have to beat you to death, boy. I pestered him until he let me. I had my electrical engineer's degree just about finished. And I was going to go make money because I was tired of being poor. And I heard the gospel and got saved. And from the time I got saved, the only thing I ever wanted to do since was serve God. In that, to be able to reach people and train people in the Word of God. Now see, I don't, I don't have any secret formula, guys. I, I want you to keep your Bible open all the time. I, just grab it. Say, preacher, you know, I think I, I disagree with you on this. Will you meet with me some afternoon and I'll bring you my scriptures and you'll bring you say, well, I'm, I believe what my mother taught. I don't care what your mother taught. My mother used to quote Bible verses too when she was lost. She'd say things like, show not thy nakedness even to the dogs. Do you know that's not in the Bible? Dogs don't care if you're naked or not. They don't care. Cows or horses or nothing else, okay? She had a whole bunch of those things about 
Found out after I was saved and read my Bible, those aren't Bible verses. You're just trying to bother me. Crown of joy. Who have you ever won to Christ? We're His ambassadors trying to persuade you. Come to the Lord. We have crown of life. That's faithful to death. Just faithful to death. You know what faithfulness is? Not quitting. Just keep doing it. How hard is it for us when Christians, they're over here one day and they're over there the next day and they're over here the next day. Emotionally, they're one side or the other. Physically, the other side or the other. One day, they're wanting to give to missions. Next month, next week, they'll steal your wallet. I'm talking about being steadfast and a crown of glory. You say, what do you do with that? Revelation 4 says that when we stand in front of the Lord, that we shall cast our crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. It's an offering to God when we stand in front of Him. That's what those crowns are. And there's authority, and we'll talk about that in that kingdom time. Somebody has to be in charge. Some of you guys don't really love it, okay? And I'm not much of a totalitarian. I'm not much of it being in the charge. I liked, you know the best rank in all the military to be? What is equivalent now to E5? You say, what's that mean? It means you're over enough that you don't have to clean toilets, but you're under enough, you're not responsible for much of anything. It is a great place if, you just, if you're in the military. Now, if you get up much higher, like my nephews and my boy, and you get to eight and nines, they got a real lot of responsibility. Better to be a major. I have a son-in-law who's a major. How many of y'all in the military? How many ever wondered what majors did? They, When they got promoted to major, they disappeared and went to battalion. We thought they just ate them because they never showed up again and we didn't know what they did. They're all they're the ones doing all that back work and paper, by the way. They're, they're running everything. So my son-in-law will tell you that they do a lot of work. At least that's what he says. Amen. We never saw them again, so there you go. I want you to understand this, guys. Authority. Don't you, don't you want to be able to serve the Lord for the first time in your whole lifetime without any flaws, with a brand new body, in a perfect place, being able to please Him like you always wanted to do here, but the flesh stops us. See, I do. I'm looking forward to it. When we're talking about a Christian's reward, get this thing settled about your sin. It's either under the blood of Christ or you're still guilty of the penalty. There is no other sacrifice for sin. Works won't do it. Ask Cain. It's the blood. For it washed us from our sins in His own blood. Finished. Done. And then He would say, in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. If God doesn't keep that, He's a liar. So get over that. Why are we serving? I don't want to serve because I have to. I want somebody that loves me enough that they do things for me because they won't. And so does God. He's looking for people who are willing to serve Him out of love. We love you enough. We'll do whatever you want us to do. And then God turns around and says, if you do that, I'll give you a reward for it. There's an old song that says, will there be any stars in your crown? Anybody, y'all remember that? Old, old song. He's simply saying, you stand in front of God, are you going to be there with something to offering or empty-handed? The good news is, either way you'll be there. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. I'm grateful that the God I have knows my abilities and He allows me to serve Him with my ability. I pray, Father, that Everybody here might know Jesus as their Savior and being secure in their eternity with God first 
And then, Lord, work on this thing. What would God have me to do? And, Lord, I pray that you'd give us your wisdom and you'd let us know your will in every decision we make and all the things we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me just a minute. Number 160. Oh, soul, are you weary?